back in the late 70s, a youth pastor posted a sign on the billboard, bulletin board, there in the church. At the top of the sign was in capital letters, one word, S-E-X, sex. And underneath the word, he said, now that I have your attention. Uh, please note that on August 11th at 6.30, we're having a back-to-school bash for grades 7 through 12. <laughs> now, some church leaders didn't find that very funny. And they didn't like him using the word sex in church. For centuries, the church has been reticent to speak about sex. That's why in our culture, there's largely been only one voice in this conversation, Satan's. It's odd that the church has been so silent. The Bible isn't. The Apostle Paul isn't. Let's look at some of his counsel on that matter this morning as we conclude our series, Marriage Practices. I invite you to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 7. As we think about God's gift to marriage called sex. And now that I have your attention, I invite you to hear the word of the Lord through the Apostle Paul. Now in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to use a woman for sex. But because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. Same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then, come together again, otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were as I am. He's, that is, single. He's not married. Paul is not married. But each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, singleness. One person has another, marriage. Paul is writing to a troubled church in Corinth and he's answering their questions, he's offering them guidance, he's trying his best to help them navigate the turbulent waters of a culture that's hostile to Christians and hostile to Christian morality. Paul has a big job and his work is complicated by the fact that rival parties are wrestling for power in the church at Corinth. Uh, the, it's the anything goes party who feels that the grace of God allows a, a moral free fall. Uh, their rhetoric sounds like this, do, do whatever feels good. The flesh is evil, so who can help it? And who's to blame for getting some sex anytime, anywhere, any way, and with anyone you can, go for it. The other party in the church is the ascetic party. The killjoys, the no fun boys, the life's a pain, you gotta grin and bear it bunch. Their rhetoric sounds like this. Sex is a necessary evil. It's a flesh thing. It's part of human weakness. Real Christians don't need sex and abstain from sex. So it's into that context that Paul writes this letter. He responds to the anything goes party in chapters 5 and 6, drawing some spirit-inspired lines on sexual relationships outside of marriage. And here in chapter 7, Paul responds to the teaching about sex and marriage that's taught by the ascetic party, those who think life is to be endured rather than enjoyed. In verse 1, Paul writes, It's good for a man not to use a woman for sex. Now, Paul is not teaching this. He's quoting the teaching of the ascetic party in the church. Paul challenges that teaching. Paul understands that sexual drives are strong. Nobody asks for them. We don't conjure them up. Nobody needs to teach us to have sexual drives. Uh, we discover them as our bodies mature. In healthy people, sexual drives are a given. And given is the right word because though we may have trouble handling it sometimes, God created all of us to be sexual persons. Sex is the gift of God. It's not our idea. It's God's idea. In Matthew 19, 4, Jesus says, Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female? 
God created sex. It was not some big mistake God made when he ran out of good ideas. It was not some, oops, what have I done? Uh, John Ortberg puts it this way. When Eve brought, was brought to Adam, Adam's response was not, I'll bet she has a great personality. <laughs> Remember what Adam said. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Or to put it in Ozark hillbilly language, yeehaw. <laughs> Sex is God's idea. It's God's gift to humankind. And though Paul, as we see in verse 7, he chooses to remain single, he doesn't jump the bandwagon of those in Corinth who were teaching that sex is some kind of intrusion on God's design, some evil which men and women have to tolerate if they're going to give birth to the next generation. Sex is God's idea and sex is a good thing. It's a gift even. But Paul quickly draws some boundaries around that gift in verse 2. But because sexual immorality is common, he writes, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. Sex is a good thing, it's God's idea, but only within the bonds of marriage. And a lot of people ignore that, always have. Uh, there was as little sexual restraint in Paul's day as there is in ours. According to one scholar, these Gentile Christians came out of a culture in which marriages were not usually love matches, but family arrangements. Typically, men in their middle 20s were paired with young women barely in their teens whom they usually had never met. So it was expected that married men would have sexual relations with other women, such as prostitutes, female slaves, or mistresses from lower classes. And that's not all. Homosexuality, other forms of sexual immorality were also part of the fabric of Roman culture. Sexual drives were out of control. Many within the culture did sexually what they wanted, when they wanted, anything goes. And no small part of the Corinthian congregation was composed of people who came out of that culture. Boundaries were needed then, boundaries are needed now. And Paul wasn't hesitant to draw them. Sex is reserved for marriage, period. Sex before marriage, sex with other partners after marriage is out of the bounds. And sex out of bounds is like a river out of its banks. Chaos and destruction are sure to follow, broken hearts, fractured lives, disease risk, or becoming either the user or the used. Sex outside of marital boundaries is sin. It offends God, it hurts us, it cheapens God's gift of sex. Sex is a good thing, God created it, but only within the appropriate boundaries of marriage. Eugene Peterson translates this passage, sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and to provide for a balanced, fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. So husbands and wives need to make the most of the sexual relationship in their marriage. It's only on this side of heaven that that, that will even be a part of our relationships because in heaven all the ecstasies, all the intimacies are bound up in fellowship and personal relationships with Jesus and with others. Sex is not even needed in those days and times. So it's important that we make the most of it in this world, in, in the sexual relationship in marriage, and the word relationship is important here. Because sex is more than the release of sexual tension. If that's all it is, then we human beings are not much different than the animals, are we? And we are different than the animals. We were created in the image of God with the capacity for a deep relationship with God and a deep relationship with others. And God gives the gift of sex to be part of the husband-wife relationship. Sex functions in that relationship in a variety of ways. Linda Dillo offers six biblical reasons why God gave the gift of sex to married couples. For one thing, it's to create life. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. That's Genesis 1, 27 and 28. God gave the gift of sex to create life. God gave the gift of sex for intimate oneness. 
Listen to Genesis 2, 24 and 25. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. Intimate oneness. God gave the gift of sex for unique knowledge. The Bible uses the euphemism to know as a way of describing the sexual relationship between a husband and wife. Genesis 4.1 reads, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived in Borcain. He knew her, unique knowledge. God also gave the gift of sex for pleasure. In Proverbs 5, 18 and 19, we read this bit of wisdom. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice with the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Some Christians come into marriage with a lot of sexual baggage. Maybe they were abused as youngsters, which is such heavy duty baggage, it will probably take a counselor to unpack it. And others carry baggage into the marriage because they grew up in a home where sex was a taboo subject. And because their church never said a word about sex, other than to condemn certain forms of sexual behavior or challenge their teenagers to wait on sex until marriage. I mean, you can see what happens, can't you? Some Christians get this idea that sex is some kind of necessary evil and we join Corinth's ascetic party. Consequently, folks with that mindset come to marriage bracing themselves for sex. They don't enjoy it. And it usually means their spouse isn't going to enjoy it either. Sex becomes a burden rather than a blessing in their marriage. There's no real pleasure in it. And that's sad because God intends the gift of sex in marriage for pleasure. Proverbs teaches this. God doesn't want us to endure this part of our marriage. He wants us to enjoy one another and find pleasure in it. And that's not all. God also gave the gift of sex to marriage as a defense against sexual temptations because the drives are strong. Marriage offers the appropriate boundaries. Our own text teaches this. Listen again to verse two. But because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his wife and each woman with her own husband. And look at verse five. Do not deprive one another except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. If husband and wife do not meet these needs for one another, one or both of them may be tempted to find the meeting of that need in someone else. These days, many Christian men were discovering they don't seek a relationship with another real woman, but with the images of some woman in pornography. That is destroying marriages. It's killing marital sex. And if I'm talking to you today, if this is your problem, your issue, your sin, you need to take responsibility for breaking that addiction. And it doesn't help to blame your wife. So confess it, seek her prayers, Get some help. And we have some things in the church to help you with this. If you don't, you will ruin whatever sexual life you have in marriage and you may lose your marriage altogether. God provides sex within marriage as a defense against sexual temptations. And God provides the gift of sex for comfort. After the death of David's and Bathsheba's child, the Bible says in 2 Samuel 12, 24, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and he went to her and lay with her. That intimacy, that oneness, that in times of shared sorrow can be comforting, can be reassuring. And God gives husbands and wives the gift of sex to help in times like these. So the sexual relationship is much more than just releasing sexual tension, than just having kids. God provides the gift of sex and marriage to meet a multitude of needs and to offer a deep intimacy within the total relationship. And it's no small part of that relationship. It's important. Paul is a single man, but he 
recognizes this. That's why in, in verses three and four, look at those verses, Paul writes, a husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband doesn't have the right over his own body, but his wife does. And when they choose to abstain, Paul tells us in verse five that abstention should be only for a limited time for a spiritual purpose, and as we see in verse six, as a concession rather than the rule. Sexual fulfillment in marriage is so important in the relationship that in verse three, Paul calls it a marital duty. Duty literally means give back that which is owed. It's a duty, it's a covenant. It's not a tool for manipulation, either as a weapon or as a reward to get whatever you want out of the relationship. The Bible says that we have a duty, not in the worst sense of the word, but in the best sense of the word, to offer mutual joy to one another in marriage. It's not about whose needs are are most important or who's in charge or who's gonna get their way. It's about mutuality and love, sacrifice, service, selflessness, and it's never forced. It's offered. Again, Eugene Peterson translates it well. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. So don't think sex is a mat- as a, it, 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 it doesn't matter, that it's just that it's no big deal in marriage, that it's some kind of take it or leave it thing. It's a duty, it's an opportunity to love and serve one another in marriage in a way you cannot serve and love any other. Husbands and wives ignore this truth to the peril of their marriage because sex is an important part of the total relationship and total is a key word we best not overlook because sex is more than some physical thing. It's a soul thing. Sexuality has physical and emotional dimensions for both men and women. Men tend to most appreciate the physical side, while women tend to crave more of the emotional connection. Wives enjoy the physical relationship more when it's part of the context of an emotionally fulfilling marriage where they feel loved and cherished, supported, appreciated all the time, rather than only when the husband's feeling a little amorous. Most women need that kind of total relationship to experience the intimate, gentle, gentle, joyful oneness that comes in a sexual connection, they tend to need and enjoy the loving that leads there. When we men tend to be simpler creatures, sorry guys, just kind of shallow in a lot of ways, often willing to get physical without tending to the underlying emotional connections. Gary Smalley liked to say that in this area of marriage, uh, men are like microwaves and women are like crock pots. (laughs) Men who want to improve this part of their marriage are going to learn to be patient and sensitive. They're going to try to understand their wife's moods and her needs, and they're going to offer tender affection at times other than when they want to connect on a sexual level. They'll try to live a lifestyle of loving and cherishing their wives day in and day out in their marriage. They'll give attention to the total relationship. But making the most of this part of marriage doesn't happen overnight. Look who I'm talking to. You know this. Like other areas of marriage, the sexual relationship requires time. It requires growth to mature and for it to reach its fullest bloom. One of the great illusions is that this part of marriage should come naturally. I mean, it seems to work that way in movies and in novels. It's always passionate, always perfect. But it's not always that way in real life, is it? When Dane and I were married, we had no money for a honeymoon. We had a low-budget wedding and a bargain basement honeymoon. Took her to Tulsa for the weekend. It's not Tulsa, Jamaica, or Tulsa, Hawaii, or even Tulsa, Florida. It's Tulsa, Oklahoma. Every woman's dream. Uh, We didn't leave the church in a limousine either. We left in my 64 Ford Fairlane ranch wagon. Thankfully, my uncle offered his Impala for us to borrow and drive for the weekend, so we switched cars, and we hit the road, and we stopped on the way to Tulsa in Joplin, Missouri. I mean, it was our wedding night, so nothing but the best, right? We ate at the Sirloin Stockade, 
uh, just off the interstate. Are, are you hip and classy enough to know about the sirloin stockade? It's known for its ambiance and its romance. But that, that's where we went because I, I think I hadn't had steak five times in my 21 years. I considered steak a delicacy. And while I, I didn't think about it at the time, upon further reflection, I may have had some subliminal mischief up my sleeve eating there because if you remember those restaurants, you'll recall that on top of the sign was this giant bull. <laughs> a giant bull, the, the forever symbol of fertility in ancient lives. Maybe I was trying to get Dana psyched up and I didn't even know it. <laughs> well, we made it to Tulsa. It was kind of late, but not to worry because I'd booked rooms at the Tulsa Hilton. Not the Bates Motel, not the Dew Drop Inn, not even the Holiday Inn, but the Hilton. I hadn't spent three nights in a motel in my whole life, so I thought we were going first class with the Hilton. Even more, I paid for it in advance and ordered the honeymoon package. That entitled us to a choice of champagne or a fruit basket. Being good Baptists, we took the fruit. And apparently nobody ever chooses the fruit because they seem shocked and embarrassed when we ask for it. The fruit? <laughs> no, take the champagne. It's relaxing, it's romantic, it's perfect for a wedding night. We'll take the fruit. I said, unbending in my Baptist convictions. <laughs> okay, we'll see what we can scrape together. That's what they did. They scraped it together. We ended up with a small assortment of bruised apples and brown bananas and a squishy orange or two darn near made a Methodist out of me right on the spot. <laughs> I mean, the fruit basket was, the fruit basket was a big disappointment. We were not getting off on the right foot. Had to get better, right? Well, after Dana took what seemed to me like the longest bath in the history of the world, <laughs> we got ready for bed, and that's when we made another startling discovery. Our room was full of fleas. Now, now, fleas do not pester me. I don't think I'm sweet enough, but they lit into Dana like she was a golden retriever. <laughs> and they were thick. They were kind of in the carpet, by the bed, some even on the bed. And the fleas did not add to the enjoyment of our wedding night. And being young and shy, totally inexperienced in motels, I did not go down and demand another room and better fruit. Uh, so it was some two nights, just Dana, me, and the fleas. <laughs> Which sounds like a really bad country song, doesn't it? <laughs> Just Dana, me, and the fleas in our honeymoon in Tulsa. <laughs> I was an idiot. But to make it up to her, I took her to McDonald's for lunch on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, McDonald's, I know what you're thinking. A loser, and you would be right. And as if things couldn't get worse, Dana left her purse in our seat there in McDonald's. We hadn't gone far till we realized it. We went back. We found the purse where she left it. But the wallet was gone. We found it in the trash can, but the money was gone. I mean, if Ronald McDonald had been standing there, I'd have decked him, <laughs> punched him out. But at least Dana was sweet and comforting and helped keep things in perspective. She looked at me and she said, you know, this wouldn't have happened in Hawaii. <laughs> she didn't really say that. I made that part up. But I still had enough cash in my pocket to spend the afternoon at, drumroll please, the Tulsa Zoo. <laughs> I know how to make a woman happy. Every woman's dream, that's me. Well, come Monday, we took my uncle's car back to Branson and we drove the rust bucket down to Fayetteville to set up house in our 100 bucks a month duplex on the little cul-de-sac just a block or so off Razorback Road. I share this with you to point out that our love life doesn't always go as we plan. There are many variables we can't predict and don't control. Our honeymoon was not the stuff dreams are made of. But then again, how many honeymoons, maybe even yours, had one or two things go that you didn't hope for or plan for? Our love life isn't always accompanied by fireworks and electricity, champagne and caviar. Sometimes it's more like bad fruit, fleas and petty larceny. And contrary to what the movies imply, most of us are not Joe Stud Muffin or Harriet Hot Lips from the start, if we ever become them at all. 
The physical dimension of relationship doesn't happen on its own. It doesn't just come naturally like all dimensions of the wedding, the marriage relationship. We learn to grow over time and in the context of the total relationship. So if you're married, maybe you'll use this sermon as an opportunity to talk about your relationship, this part of your relationship with one another. Maybe you need to add more romance to your marriage, more everyday affection, kindness, sensitivity. Maybe you need to clear the air, talk about some past traumas, baggage, or some embarrassments that are creating roadblocks to the sexual dimension of your marriage. Maybe you need to ask for or offer forgiveness. Maybe you need to talk about disappointments in your relationship that have caused you to withdraw from your spouse in this area too. I hope when you leave today, you'll pick up a discussion sheet out there on the information center that you can take, take this sermon home and apply it to your lives in particular ways. The sexual relationship is just one part of the total relationship, but it's a big part. And the overall health of your marriage is greatly impacted by this area. So don't neglect it and don't expect it to improve on its own. Make a commitment to talk about this and to work on this with your mate. A marriage counselor friend told me some years ago that he discovered that if the sexual relationship in a marriage is mutually satisfying to husband and wife, then the chances of even troubled couples weathering hard times and sticking it all the way through to the end increase dramatically. So talk about this area with one another. Get some counseling if you need to. It matters. Sex is a gift from God. And I pray that you and your spouse would enjoy the kind of sexual relationship that God intends. Not as the sum of your relationship, but as an important part of your total relationship. A part that a part that brings you deeper connection, joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment till health fails or till death do you part. Lord, thank you for this gift. I know in this service I'm certainly not talking to rookies. Everyone in this room who's married has gone through various issues around this matter in their marriage, maybe even facing some now. So Lord, we pray for your touch, your intervention, your encouragement, your strength to deal with things we need to deal with. We pray, God, for those who are single among us that is challenging as it is, that they will lean deeply into you to find strength to, to live faithfully uh, in celibacy. Uh, and Lord, we pray that, that you would meet those deeper needs in ways that only you can do that for them. And we pray that uh, you would even use a message like this to draw somebody who doesn't know Jesus to Jesus for salvation and life. We pray in your name, amen. So I invite you this morning to respond to Christ. Uh, This is his gift to us. God wants us to know him and all the joys that are a part of it. Um, And so for married couples, sex is a part of that. And so I invite you to, if you don't know Christ, to put your faith in Jesus. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead. He alone can save you from your sins. You can't be saved anywhere else. And trust me, sex is not gonna save you. The momentary pleasures don't add up to a fulfilling life. And that's only found in Christ, whether you're single or married. It's only found in Christ. Find him today. He's looking for you. I invite you today, Christian, to ask the Lord to help you. If you're, if you're married, ask the Lord to help you in this area. If you're single, ask the Lord to help you in this area and to walk his way. And I invite you to come join the church if God puts that on, on you. Christians are made for relationship and church is one part of the relationships for which we were made. So I invite you to link up with us. Maybe you just want to come and pray for revival in your life, in our country, in in your marriage, whatever. But take this time of response to listen intently to God's Spirit and 
respond as he leads you and moves you. If you're online, you can text ACTION to 94000. You get links there to tell us what God's stirring in your life. And if you're in the room, there'll be ministers here to receive you as you come. Let's stand together. You respond as God moves in your life.